Hello, everyone, and welcome to AFTD's educational webinar series. Today's webinar is Bringing the ALS FTD Clinical Experience into Focus. Our presenter is Dr. Beth Rush, a clinical neuropsychologist and assistant professor of psychology at Mayo Clinic in Florida. I'm Sharon Denny, Senior Director of Programs at AFTD. On behalf of all of us here and Dr. Rush, I'd like to thank you for joining us today. Before we get started, I would like to go over a few items to help you participate in today's event. Dr. Rush will present our information in two parts. Following each part of the presentation, there'll be an opportunity for questions. We ask that you send us your questions by typing them into the questions section, which is located towards the bottom of your control panel. Please send your questions as you think of them, and we will ask as many as possible at the end of each section. We will have you muted for the duration of the presentation. You should be able to hear us, but we can't hear you, and this just helps us to keep the background noise down to a minimum so that everyone can hear the presenter clearly. If you have any technical issues, please write a message in the questions box, and AFTD's Lauren Godier will try to answer the issue without interrupting our guest. We are recording this presentation, and we'll post it on AFTD's website and YouTube channel afterwards. Please share it with anyone else that you think might be interested in the topic. For those of you who are meeting us for the first time, AFTD is the leading national nonprofit organization focused entirely on the FTD disorders. Our mission is to improve the quality of life for people affected by FTD and drive research for a cure. We do this every day through advancing research, awareness, support, education, and advocacy. AFTD provides help and support for people facing FTD and for the professionals who serve them. We provide the only helpline in the country that's devoted to FTD. Each helpline call and email is answered by a specially trained staff member. AFTD's website and publications provide reliable disease education and care management information. And our growing national network of FTD support groups now numbers 103 leaders offering 79 groups across the US. AFTD support group leader volunteers receive education and resources to help them meet the needs of families in their community. We also offer unique opportunities for FTD group leaders to network with each other, and new facilitators are always welcome. And finally, for over a decade, AFTD has funded innovative, basic, and clinical research conducted by talented investigators worldwide. The research section of AFTD's website helps people to learn how they can participate in efforts to advance the understanding of the disease, improve treatments, and unlock a cure. I'd invite everybody to consider getting involved with our organization, and there's a couple of up, upcoming opportunities that you might want to consider. AFTD's 2020 Education Conference will be on Friday, April 17th in Baltimore, Maryland. Come and learn and connect with others during a day-long program as FTD experts present the latest advances in FTD research and care. Please visit our website for more information and to sign up for our newsletters. Registration opens in January. Volunteers are the energy behind everything we do. They are central to building awareness and advocacy. Whether you're diagnosed with FTD, care for a loved one, or a healthcare provider, join us to build awareness and advocate as one community. To get involved, you can contact us at info at the AFTD.org. And the next installment of our educational webinar series will be in March. We'll be sending more information out about this shortly. And now, it's my pleasure to introduce our guest, Dr. Beth Rush. Dr. Rush is a clinical neuropsychologist and assistant professor of psychology at the Mayo Clinic in Florida, at Mayo Clinic Florida in Jacksonville, Florida. She's worked clinically evaluating people with FTD and ALS or MND for the last 14 years. Dr. Rush has been involved with the interdisciplinary Mayo Clinic Florida ALS Association Certified Treatment Centers of Excellence team since 2005. She's dedicated to evaluating and responding to thinking and behavior changes in ALS FTD and to increasing education and awareness of the various ways in which FTD and ALS or MND present. Dr. Rush has written website, clinical webinar, and print educational materials for the ALS Association that focus on responding to the thinking and behavior changes that occur in ALS FTD overlap, and is a frequent presenter on this topic. So without further ado, I'm pleased to welcome Dr. Beth Rush. Thank you so much to all of you uh, for having me. Um, thank you to the AFTD um, for inviting me to talk about this important topic. 
I want to spend a lot of time today talking about what we do know and what we don't know about the overlap between ALS and FTD. And many of us may feel like the clinical experience we go through as a person with disease or someone caring for someone with disease is a little rocky at times. Um, and I think what's happening is that the clinical experience of a person with disease overlap needs to catch up somewhat to um, the science that has exploded and the discovery that has exploded in the last 10 years. So I'll be spending a lot of time today talking about what is and what can be, where the opportunities lie. So today, by the time you leave this presentation and we have the opportunity to discuss some things, I hope you'll leave with a good understanding of what defines syndromes of frontal temporal degeneration and what defines ALS, or amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. You'll be learning the signs and features of motor neuron disease and how it can present when a person has a frontal temporal degeneration syndrome. And we'll be talking about who needs to know about the ALS-FTD overlap. Importantly, we're going to spend time walking through the clinical experience of a person with ALS and a person with FTD. And we're gonna talk about which components may be missing from the clinical experience of an individual with ALS FTD overlap. And with that, I'm going to make some proposals. I'm gonna talk about what could change, how things could be bettered, how people with disease could be better heard and resources could be more quickly identified. What I see is a tremendous opportunity for the ALS FTD overlap community and my hope is that in leaving the presentation today, you'll have education that empowers you to be part of um, that change. So let's start. What is an amyotrophic lateral sclerosis? The minute someone says ALS, we think about Lou Gehrig and we think about the baseball player who had um, absolute um, loss of motor control and we think about old stories that would tell us, you know, ALS is almost like a locked-in syndrome. People progressively lose the ability to move, write, breathe, but they maintain the ability to think and behave. They're just locked in. They can't speak what their thoughts are or write what they intend. Let's talk about what ALS is and what it isn't. So ALS is what we think of as a primary neurodegenerative disease that results in deterioration of motor neurons, and motor neurons can be found in the brain, the brain stem, and the spinal cord. There are two types of motor neurons. There's upper motor neurons and lower motor neurons, and neurologists will often refer to lower motor neuron presentation or upper motor neuron presentation, and to the lay person, that makes absolutely no sense. Upper motor neurons are the brain cells that take information from the motor cortex of the brain and communicate to the spinal cord. It's a long track going from the brain and descending through the brain stem into the spinal cord. Lower motor neurons are the smaller track that go from the spinal cord to an actual muscle or gland that needs to be moved or innervated. There's actually a continuum in motor neurons where you could have damage or dysfunction to the upper motor neuron tract or the lower motor neuron tract or both. Importantly, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, ALS, is defined by having both upper and lower motor neuron dysfunction. But there are other conditions of motor neuron disease that lead to progressive degeneration of the motor neurons. One is called primary lateral sclerosis, which basically impacts the upper motor neurons first, or potentially only. And then there is progressive muscular atrophy, which tends to focus on dysfunction in the lower motor neurons. And so the presentations of motor neuron disease can be quite different depending on whether disease starts in an upper motor neuron light way or affecting the lower motor neurons. To make things even more confusing, sometimes, it's just the cranial nerves that support breathing and speech and swallowing that are impacted by the disease that causes ALS. And in that case, 
one person might be diagnosed with progressive bulbar palsy. And that is because the disease is impacting only the motor nuclei of the bulbar cranial nerves, but not necessarily the long tracks of the upper motor neurons or the tracks of the lower motor neuron from spinal cord to muscle. So you're going to hear me use the words MND a lot for motor neuron disease. And the reason why I'm saying that is because in the world of ALS, ALS is upper and lower motor neuron dysfunction. It's defined by that. But many people may start with primary lateral sclerosis or progressive muscular atrophy and eventually go on to develop ALS, full-blown ALS with disease progression. Onset of motor neuron disease is typically between ages 40 and 60. And for those of you in the community of frontal temporal degeneration syndromes, this is already sounding kind of familiar. It more frequently affects men more than women. And motor neuron disease, in again, includes ALS, primary lateral sclerosis, PLS, and PMA, progressive muscular atrophy. You, the United States is really the only place where the term ALS is kind of distinguished from the term motor neuron disease when referencing patients with ALS. If you'll find articles from the UK or in Japan simply discussing motor neuron disease, and the terms are used interchangeably. Contrary to what we know in the frontal de temporal dementia syndromes, most cases of motor neuron disease are sporadic. Only five to 10% are considered to be hereditary, things that we can acquire genetically. But unfortunately, the epidemiology or our understanding of prevalence and incidence is truly challenged by a lack of consensus on what counts as hereditary disease. That'll come back to a conceptual point I wanna make in a moment. 5,000 people are diagnosed in the US each year with ALS. And the life expectancy is relatively brief from diagnosis to death. It's two to five years from diagnosis. Less than 50% of people with ALS will survive three years and less than 10% survive after 10 years. People who have PLS or PMA tend to have longer life expectancies because remember their disease course might be a little bit slower starting only in the upper motor neurons or the lower motor neurons and eventually progressing. The morbidity or toll of motor neuron disease is associated with the weakness, the fact that people become more dependent on those around them because they can't speak or breathe or swallow or write or move and the psychological adjustment for a person with disease and or his or her family is quite significant. People with motor neuron disease will eventually pass away, not from the disease itself, but by the fact that the motor neurons required for respiration and swallowing give out. And without that muscular tone intact, there's respiratory distress and pneumonia or dysphagia that leads to pneumonia. Typically, it's almost a year before the diagnosis of ALS is finalized. And the reason for that is because there is a high risk of making a false positive diagnosis. No one wants to have a diagnosis of a disease that moves this quickly and can have such uh, morbidity. Um, so there's a lot of checking and double checking to make sure nothing slower moving, nothing more reversible, or nothing static can be identified. So how does motor neuron disease present if, it, if it's going to present? It may be subtly that a person develops more difficulty with balance. They're less stable. It may be that the person's muscles start to shrink. You really could notice this more in distal muscles such as the hands or the feet or sometimes in the shoulders. You might see what we call fasciculations or small little movements underneath twitches, underneath uh, the skin where motor neurons are losing their innervation under the, of the muscle. And you see like just little bits of twitch to a muscle. A person could start developing shortness of breath, especially once they're moving, or if they're in a position such as laying flat where the diaphragm, which is a muscle, needs to work more um, assertively. There may be motor weakness and a person could lose coordination or strength. And a person's walking could change quite a bit. 
at first it may seem that their legs are just developing some stiffness or it always seems like their knees are locked when they're walking. Their walking may become slower and they may become more unstable as a function of this change. Motor neuron disease, like I mentioned before, can definitely start with the muscles that provide tone to the organs that support speech. So you could hear slurring or dysarthria. You can hear a person start to mispronounce words that they've always been able to pronounce. And there can be a slowing of speech or a challenge to get speech out. Motor neuron disease can present as problems with swallowing, or it may be less obvious. Starting off, it might start with coughing after eating or being unable to clear one's throat. So you hear lots of <clears throat> or <clears throat> noises as someone's eating or talking. And finally, motor neuron disease can present with something called pseudobulbar affect, which we can see in frontal temporal degeneration syndromes as well. And what this is, is a disinhibition of emotion. This is characterized by a heightened reactivity. And the way that I usually evaluate for this is I might say, do you ever find that once you start crying, it's hard to stop crying? Or sometimes you break out in laughter, but no one else is laughing, and then it's hard to stop. This is a reflex that goes wrong, uh, so to speak, because of the presence of disease. And sometimes it can be one of the initial signs of motor neuron disease. So now that we've talked about ALS motor neuron disease, let's turn to what you're more familiar with, the frontal temporal degeneration syndromes and what characterizes these. And I think it's important to review these because just as the motor neuron disease um, spectrum is quite heterogeneous in ALS, the spectrum of disease and clinical presentation for the frontal temporal degeneration syndromes is quite heterogeneous or diverse too. So FTD syndromes are also primary neurodegenerative diseases that result in functional and structural deterioration of the frontal and temporal lobes of the brains and the cognitive connections in these areas. FTDs can be caused by different protein pathologies and have a wide array of clinical presentations. We hear the most about behavioral variant FTD, which is a form of frontal temporal dementia where a person loses inhibitions socially or has becomes poor in judgment or becomes more withdrawn. But we hear a little bit less about other forms of frontal temporal degeneration syndromes in ALS that would include agrammatic primary progressive aphasia, semantic dementia, and the FTD ALS overlap. There are other frontal temporal degeneration syndromes, and these are progressive supranuclear palsy, cortical basal degeneration syndrome, and primary progressive apraxia of speech. Although some cases of primary progressive apraxia of speech have been seen in the context of people who also develop motor neuron disease, there are less cases of progressive supranuclear palsy and cortical basal degeneration syndrome going on to evolve motor neuron disease. Now, that's not to say that motor neurons aren't eventually evolved, involved. So for instance, in progressive supranuclear palsy, people with disease will develop problems with speaking and swallowing, but that's because of bulbar dysfunction. The bulbar muscles uh, lose innervation. It's not the same as a um, motor neuron disease like ALS, but it's part of the manifestation of the disease progression of progressive supranuclear palsy and how the tauopathy um, ascends through the system, the, the, the neuropathological system. FTDs are more, most common um, for people under age 60, and they are the most common form of dementia for people who have a younger onset of dementia. There are 60,000 cases in the United States. Frequently, there's a misdiagnosis as Alzheimer's dementia. Alzheimer's dementia tends to be the dementia that lay people have the most familiarity with. It has a higher base rate overall in individuals in the U.S. population. And therefore, individuals with less experience with frontal temporal degeneration syndromes and identifying the signs may misdiagnose it as Alzheimer's. The hereditary profile of frontal temporal dementia syndromes is different than ALS. 
In this case, 60% of the cases have no hereditary component, but a 40% of the cases do have a hereditary component. And in fact, in 2011 at the Mayo Clinic in Florida, um, a gene, uh, genotype was identified that is one of the biggest um, explanations for why there is an FTD ALS uh, overlap, and that is the C9 ORF72 repeat expansion. What we know about FTDs in general is that three proteins are generally implicated, including TDP43, tau, and FUS. Interestingly, in the discovery of the FTD ALS overlap and the C9 ORF72 repeat expansion genotype, we learned that TDP43 proteinopathy or pathology was quite common in ALS and FTD, and that's part of what helped us to identify the C9 ORF72 repeat expansion as a mutation of interest. FTD strikes younger people and younger people are still working. They have families, they may have older parents they're caring for, they may have children that are still in the home. The life expectancy of a person with a frontal temporal degeneration syndrome is usually seven to 13 years from onset. And mortality, not unlike Alzheimer's and other forms of dementia, is usually related to progression of the proteinopathy or pathology to the point where it involves all the organs and um, and, and eventually results in pneumonia. Generally, FTD takes 3.6 years on average to get an accurate diagnosis, and that's an interesting statistic as well, especially when you consider that there's not much time to get it right. So how does FTD present? In a lot of different ways. A person could have childlike or inappropriate behavior. They could forget intended uh, actions, what they wanted to do. You might hear someone say, I wanted to do this, but I couldn't get my arm to do it or my hand to do it. They lose a filter in conversation. They more, a person may have more difficulty understanding instructions or following through with instructions. An individual may have a change in judgment or manners. Um, they might, might speak sentences that convey little or no meaning. They may have trouble speaking. Their spelling may decline. They may show a lack of empathy or concern for others. They may say that they know what they wanna say, but they can't quite get it out. They call that the tip of the tongue phenomenon. Um, there could be an inability to concentrate. Behaviorally, you may see the person getting stuck on one idea or activity, and that's all they want to do. You can't reason with them at all. They're not getting off of it anytime soon. Um, individuals will have more trouble expressing their thoughts. Yes, no answers may no longer be reliable. They may say yes when they mean no. They may see, say left when they mean right. They may cry or laugh too much, or they may write or speak words in the wrong order. So the presentation of frontal temporal degeneration syndrome can be quite heterogeneous. It can involve language, it can involve language expression, it could involve comprehension, and it can involve behavior. So who's going to have ALS FTD overlap? Well, that's a great question, isn't it? What we know from studying motor neuron disease patients is that 50% of individuals with motor neuron disease have thinking or behavior changes. Up to 20% of people with motor neuron disease will develop dementia, and most of the characterized cases look like individuals with frontal temporal degeneration syndromes. We know less about how many people with FTD go on to develop motor neuron disease and ALS. And once we walk through the patient experience, the person with disease experience, you'll understand why I make that statement. The C9 ORF72 repeat expansion discovery is an important hereditary factor and accounts for a lot of the cases of hereditary presentation that we see, but it also accounts for a decent proportion of sporadic cases that we see in ALS and an ALS FTD overlap. So why should we even look for ALS FTD overlap? Who cares, right? <laughs> we do. 
Well, people with FTD and ALS or motor neuron disease, they want to know. Research shows they want to know. And some doctors or providers might say, well, why would they want to know if they have the other? Isn't their disease already enough to bear? Why would they want to know they have something else bad? Well, caregivers want to know. They want to know what to expect. They want to know how to attribute changes that they're seeing. Is it that the person isn't trying hard enough? Is it that they're not stimulating them enough? Is it that um, they're being stubborn? Why are they showing these changes? Family members want to know. And importantly, our community is still learning, what is this phenomenon? What is ALS FTD? Who's going to get it? What, what do we do once we see it? So knowing all of this helps us learn where to place our expectations, where to place the expectations for the person with disease, where to place the expectations for the family members who are providing care, where to place the expectations of what treatments and interventions are going to help the person and what might actually hurt or complicate things. It's important to know things to know where to help with and where to place the expectations. So there's a lot we don't know yet. The epidemiology of frontal temporal dementia converting to ALS motor neuron disease remains unclear. And it's hindered by the lack of having any kind of systematic prospective data. Prospective data are those where you study everything and everyone, and you collect data about incidence and prevalence moving forward. But a lot of the studies and a lot of the data that have been reported thus far are not prospective data. They're convenient samples of either patients with motor neuron disease or frontal temporal dementia syndromes that we then go back to look for signs of the other. So how do we evaluate for cognitive and behavioral change? That's been a huge question. How do we notice changes in speech, muscle, swallowing, movement, that could signal or herald motor neuron disease? Who's looking for it? Who should evaluate for the change? How often should they be evaluating it? So this really draws attention to what does the presence of overlapping ALS or motor neuron disease and frontal, dementia, frontal temporal dementia syndrome do for the clinical experience? What is the clinical experience and what needs to change? And that's where I want to focus a lot of our time today. So there are some truths to the ALS FTD overlap. They're not myths. Symptoms in the person who has manifestations of both diseases, those symptoms are going to evolve more quickly and lifespan is shorter. Care burden is much greater. Providers of all type need to be vigilant and responsive to these changes. And it's a dynamic change without the grace of time that other primary neurodegenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's, which are slower moving, can have. The goal of all interventions should be to maintain safety and quality of life and to prevent excessive fatigue and stimulation so that function can be maintained. That is a much different goal than in stroke rehabilitation, where we expect someone to recover over time. The goals of rehabilitation interventions in stroke are to practice, practice, practice with speech and movement to regain tone. If we'd had the same approach in an individual with motor neuron disease, we would over fatigue muscles and potentially lead to more quicker burnout of function. So having providers that are educated on the differences of interventions that need to be provided in the context of motor neuron disease becomes very important. So there's tremendous opportunity in our community of ALS FTD overlap. People and families can learn more. They can know what to expect. Neurologists can be trained differently and with new scientific data, with updated data. Providers who are not neurologists can learn what helps symptoms and what exacerbates symptoms. What do you do for someone with motor neuron disease and why is it different than what you do for someone with stroke or brain tumor? Care, caregivers can develop realistic expectations and get appropriate levels of support. I can't imagine how many caregivers are completely burned out because they have to get separate resources or separate sources of information to handle the motor neuron disease symptoms 
and the frontal temporal degeneration syndrome symptoms. And most importantly, advocacy organizations can work together to expand outreach. I was delighted to be contacted by the AFTD because it shows their commitment to reaching people with frontal temporal degeneration syndromes with presentations that have that include motor neuron disease. So the experience of someone with FTD and someone with ALS are parallel. In some ways they're similar and in some ways they're different. So I want to walk us down the path of what it's like for someone with FTD. Walk us down the path of what it's like for someone getting diagnosed and monitored for ALS or motor neuron disease and then talk about what we're going to need in place of what is right now. So there are really four stages to the clinical experience of FTD including the initial consultation, the diagnostic workup, the diagnosis, and the symptom monitoring. And for the person with disease and the caregivers, every stage is fraught with a bit of an emotional roller coaster. What will be seen? What will be known? What will be discovered? How will life change? So let's walk through the path together. In the initial consultation for frontal temporal degeneration, a person may come into a neurologist, typically a general neurologist or a behavioral neurologist, reporting changes in their thinking or behavior, or due to a lack of awareness or anosognosia, their caregiver or family member may be talking about changes in thinking and behavior that the person is unaware of. The neurologist, typically behavioral neurologist, will do an exam, a neurologic exam to look for any types of reversible or static etiologies that can explain the changes that are seen. Neuroimaging will be obtained, including brain MRI, PET scan sometimes, and CT scan. And blood work will be done to rule out other etiologies, such as infection or hydrocephalus or um, a metabolic disorder or anything else that could explain what's going on. The person is eventually diagnosed with frontal temporal degeneration syndrome whether that's behavioral variant FTD or semantic dementia or uh, agrammatic progressive primary aphasia. And the behavioral neurologist brings the person and their family member back in and makes some initial recommendations for symptoms and life management. They may say they shouldn't be driving. It's a liability and it's a safety risk. You need to supervise them all the time. You need to give them their medications. You need to make sure you're in charge of their financial transactions so that their assets are guarded and protected. And then the door kind of closes. And I say that not because that's the intention or even the desire in the FTD community, but once diagnosis is made, regular contact with the behavioral neurologist or general neurologist who made the diagnosis becomes less frequent. A person may return to clinic every 12 months, sooner if they enroll in a clinical trial or a return visit. Depending on who the neurologist is and what his or her experience may be, speech therapy for functional communication may or may not be recommended. Psychiatry and psychology consultations may be ordered for a person if their behaviors become inappropriate. And usually this is done only once behavior has reached catastrophic uh, stage, although I don't want to say that that's true all the time. And then finally, it's the advocacy organizations like the AFTD that offer phone calls for support and group education, as well as websites and webinars and print materials. But the experience of having FTD and the experience of day-to-day -day life caring for someone with FTD is unbelievably lonely and isolated. It doesn't have to be. It isn't always the case, but we could be doing a little bit better. And I hear this all the time, that there are resources for slower moving dementias like Alzheimer's, but the frontal temporal degeneration syndromes are much more quickly moving and the resources aren't always there. 
So this is just the typical experience, but already you can see that in the way the diagnostic workup is done, the diagnosis, the symptom monitoring, for the average patient, it sometimes comes down to luck of the draw, whether or not the person will get a full body exam to look for signs of motor neuron disease, any kind of monitoring to see if they develop symptoms um, throughout their course uh, more quickly than every 12 months, um, any support for changes that are like swallowing or um, breathing or positional changes that lead to problems with breathing, these aren't typically done for the person with FTD, but yet there's a decent odds genetically, clinically, that a person with FTD could go on to develop some signs of motor neuron disease. But if you don't ask the questions and you don't monitor for the symptoms proactively, I guess you don't know. And that goes back to my earlier statement about what is the true epidemiology of the phenomenon of ALS-FTD overlap. We don't know. And we won't know until the right clinical experience is in place. So now let's walk down the path of someone diagnosed with ALS or motor neuron disease. Typically, the initial consultation is performed by a neuromuscular neurologist. This is a neurologist who does EMG, electromyelograms, and focuses on other motor diseases, motor neuron diseases like muscular dystrophy. And a person and his or her family will come in and talk about physical changes that are noted. Maybe there is a loss of muscle tone. Maybe there's a change in breathing or speech slurring. They can't run. There's a foot drop. They're dragging the right leg. There will be input from a person with symptoms and a family member or caregiver. And then the neuromuscular neurologist does a workup. Are they having problems due to something more benign like peripheral neuropathy or pain? Are they having problems due to an infection or a spinal cord condition, a musculoskeletal condition, an orthopedic condition? So the neuromuscular neurologist orders a variety of tests and he or she will do a full neurologic exam, physically examining the patient. But up until a few years ago, and till even today, some neuromuscular neurologists never even screen for thinking, language, and behavior change. So unless by chance, the person with disease and or his or her family member or caregiver brings it up, the neuromuscular neurologist may not know whether or not there could be anything that's a prodrome or risk state for developing frontal temporal degeneration syndrome symptoms. The typical neuromuscular neurologist workup <clears throat> for an individual suspected to have motor neuron disease will include the EMG the brain and spine neuroimaging, typically with MRI, and physical therapy, occupational therapy, motor speech evaluations, pulmonary function testing, and swallowing studies. And then blood work will be done to rule out other etiologies. Sometimes a person will be lucky enough to be referred to a PT or an OT or respiratory therapist who understands why it's hard for them to follow the directions to do the evaluation, or why it's hard to pay attention. And that provider might say, hey, you know, ALS can involve thinking. But it's typically up to the luck of the draw at this point. Most individuals, PT, OT, respiratory therapists, PFTs, who are trained to work in neuromuscular neurology, don't always get the training experiences to understand cognitive change or speech-related change outside of the speech-language pathologist and may not know what to look for beyond just the change in speech sound. Now, please know I don't mean anything um, negative to any one of these disciplines because all of us work hard to take care of the needs of a patient. But again, we're left with this circumstance where we don't know what questions to ask. And if we don't ask the right questions proactively, prospectively, and we don't monitor it over time, then we don't really have the ability to say that the overlap, overlapping syndrome is not there. So eventually the neuromuscular neurologist gets the results of his or her diagnostic workup for the person and the diagnosis of ALS or motor neuron disease is rendered. Up until approximately four years ago, um, 
the American Academy of Neurology had a paper that showed us how to deliver the diagnosis of ALS or motor neuron disease. Remember the stats on ALS and motor neuron disease, typically two years till death from the time of disease. So you have to be very careful and provide the right kind of counseling if you're going to deliver this type of diagnosis. Up until even a few years ago, many patient education materials for ALS and motor neuron disease specifically would state that it will never involve changes in thinking, behavior, or language. So the science that has exploded in the last 10 years has not caught up, caught up to the patient experience the person experience, the family experience, and the person and his or her family and providers don't know what to look for. Initial recommendations for symptoms and life management are made. And I will say this in ALS, due to some of the patient advocacy organizations like the ALS Association and the Muscular Dystrophy Association, they have developed centers uh, for excellence where people come back to clinic every three to six months. Uh, for monitoring of symptoms in speech, nutrition, physical therapy, OT, respiratory therapy, and neurology. And in the course of those multidisciplinary clinics, one can also follow cognition, but not all of these centers of excellence necessarily follow it consistently or routinely. So what I'm hoping to point out to you is the very many opportunities we have in the ALS FTD community to approach consultation workup diagnosis and symptom monitoring better. What are the risks of keeping things the way they are? The biggest risk and the, the thing that saddens me perhaps the most is that we'll never really understand the true epidemiology of the phenomenon. We can't capture it if we don't ask the right questions and we don't know what to look for. We go in with a confirmation bias. We go in with a bias in the FTD situation of saying, well, we have no reason to suspect, suspect anything but changes in behavior and language, so why look for anything more? And if we go into the motor neuron disease uh, consultation or clinical experience with confirmation bias, we may say, well, only a small proportion of patients could develop the cognitive problem, so let's not bother asking. Interventions have the opportunity to expand and evolve. Care really shouldn't come down to the luck of getting a certain provider who happens to be well-read or happens to be linked or happens to follow the, the literature of the last nine to 10 years. Importantly, if we keep the status quo of the clinical experience of ALS FTD overlap, we will lose the opportunity to share resources that are desperately needed by the people who have the disease and their families and caregivers. So now I'd like to introduce our opportunities. And I'm going to walk through the stages again of what I think happens and the opportunities that can uh, that present themselves <laughs> for us to provide a better clinical experience. So in the initial consultation of anyone where ALS motor neuron disease or frontal temporal dementia syndromes are um, suspected, the coordinating neurologist should ask about all changes in thinking, behavior, language, muscle mass, strength, breathing, swallowing, walking, eating. There should be no assumption that the problems aren't there if the person or the family member doesn't bring them up. The person with disease and the family member should be interviewed separately or at least one at a time so that if there's anosognosia or lack of awareness regarding symptoms or psychological denial of symptoms, then it's possible to get at what's really going on. The neurologist coordinating the initial consult should be very familiar with the family history, risk factors that would include anyone with a family medical history of frontal temporal dementia syndrome, ALS, Alzheimer's, or Parkinsonism. And the opportunities are that eventually we can get to the point where <coughs> neurologists seeing this type of person for initial consult will be familiar with both ALS and FTD as well as other dementia and can collect history and the timeline and time course of symptoms without confirmation bias. Again, interviewing people with disease and their family members separately about symptoms is really important for documenting 
um, loss of awareness, and making sure that care is directed to the right person. If a person has anosognosia, he or she is not gonna be able to anticipate his or her needs and is going to need the environment around him or her to intervene. Cognitive and behavioral screening should take place at that initial consult and at every subsequent meeting, regardless of whether a person or family member reports changes in thinking, language, or behavior. And neurology residency and fellowship training needs to get updated. In neuromuscular neurology, they need to learn how to do cognitive screening. And in behavioral neurology, they need to learn how to read EMGs and to evaluate and examine symptoms for signs of motor neuron disease. And this needs to be informed by the updated clinical standards for the ALS FTD overlap syndrome, the diagnosings, briefings on the literature, and so on. So we have a tremendous amount of opportunity that can change that initial consultation visit. Likewise, we can approach the initial diagnostic workup differently. Again, if you're an FTD clinic with a behavioral neurologist, you may or may not get an initial EMG, PT, OT, motor speech exam. You may not get breathing testing. You may not have swallowing studies. Likewise, if you're in an ALS clinic, you may not get all of the cognitive screening and speech screening and behavior screening that a behavioral neurologist might do. So importantly, during the diagnostic workup, I recommend that the neurologic exam includes full body examination at each point of contact with the person with disease, including a look at all muscle, tongue movement, and eye movement. Motor speech evaluation could cover subtle changes in resonance, articulation, swallowing, word finding, and ability to follow commands at every visit, regardless of if there's a complaint from the person with disease or not. An EMG should be performed at baseline, even in the absence of suspected motor neuron disease symptoms. <coughs> and finally, history and symptom monitoring with each subsequent visit should routinely touch on breathing, swallowing, drooling, which would indicate a loss of tone in the oral muscles and cranial nerves of the throat, pseudobulbar affect, thinking, behavior change, and, and change in muscle and strength. A lot can change at diagnosis. And what I propose is that with diagnosis, there needs to be education for the person with disease and his or her caregiver about what they need to start looking for from this point forward. Ideally, all individuals with either FTD or motor neuron disease would be followed in an interdisciplinary clinic of providers every three to four months. That way, symptoms could be monitored appropriately. Uh, people would be able to connect not just with the FTD for support and education, <coughs> but also the ALS Association, two very good patient advocacy organizations that provide support. In-home evaluations would be done with physical therapy, speech therapy, and occupational therapy to determine what durable medical equipment is required, what changes need to be made to the environment, People with disease and their families would learn about equipment loan closets that are available through the ALS Association, other resources that can meet current stages of symptoms. And we can carefully consider where a person with disease is currently, where are his or her current abilities, and where should we be placing our expectations. Importantly, how we modify our expectations for the person with disease and his or her function should be based on their ability not based on our hopes, not based on confirmation bias, but based on reality. And at the time of diagnosis, it's important to go through all these expectations with the person who has disease and their family. Symptom monitoring could be a lot better for people with ALS FTD overlap. Family and caregivers, need to know what to look for in terms of thinking and behavior change, particularly if ALS comes first. If frontal temporal degeneration symptoms for come first, family and caregivers need to know how to look for early identification of change that might signal the oncoming of motor neuron disease symptoms. All interventions need to be focused on safety and maintaining independence 
And if there's no insight or reduced insight for the person with disease, then interventions need to focus on the environment around the person and not the person. Physical therapy, occupational therapy, and speech language interventions should focus on maintaining function and not recovering function. So we need therapists who have experience in education with ALS, motor neuron disease, and frontal temporal dementia. I mentioned this before, but I'll state it again. Um, I'm involved with neurology residency training at my institution. And I've seen some changes already, but there's a lot of opportunity for further growth. Trainees in neuromuscular neurology need more education and exposure to behavioral neurology. They need to be introduced to the methods for cognitive screening, and they need to be introduced to the research on motor neuron disease dementia overlap. They need to know that this is going to be part of their career and their day-to-day -day monitoring of people who present with motor neuron disease. Likewise, trainees in behavioral neurology are going to need to change. They're, need, they're going to need to fully examine the person with frontal temporal dementia or dementia and not assume that the only symptoms will be thinking, language, and behavior. They will need to foul people at more frequent intervals. It's unrealistic to foul them every 12 months when symptoms can change quite quickly. And they will need to fully examine the person with disease at each interval. They will need to observe therapists working with patients, people who have motor neuron disease, so that they understand the frustrations that the person with disease may have and what their family members may experience. Outside of neurology, the PTs, the OTs, the respiratory therapists, the speech language therapists, they need to meet other providers that treat motor neuron disease and dementia. They need education about where to set expectations, how to incorporate caregivers into daily life with the person and into therapies and interventions. Providers need to know how to differentiate care based on the presence of motor neuron disease and frontal temporal dementia and not other conditions with different courses or troops, different types of disease. Again, it shouldn't come down to the luck of what provider you get for PT. You should have a physical therapist who knows what to expect, that it may be harder for the person to follow directions. They may need more nonverbal prompts than verbal prompts. During training, therapists of any kind may need to observe dementia clinic routinely and or neuromuscular clinics routinely. Again, this shouldn't come down to <coughs> luck of the draw of where, what institution they trained at or who was available to train them. So I'd like to stop here because it introduced a whole lot of opportunity for us um, to change the clinical experience for the person with ALS FTD. And at this time, before jumping into some information about caregiving, I want to see what questions you may have. Thank you very much, Dr. Rush, for this wonderful presentation and for um, giving us a lot of really thoughtful information to work with and to continue to try to learn and understand. A number of the questions that people are sending in have to do with um, specifically understanding, I think, the um, ins and outs a little bit more of the motor neuron disease and ALS. So one question is, are there motor neurons just for the purpose of breathing? So that's a great question. Um, motor neurons, everybody take a deep breath in. <laughs> take a deep breath in. And now take a deep breath out and push that air out. <sighs> we aren't conscious of the process that there are motor neurons that innervate the diaphragm that allow us to expand the diaphragm to bring breath in and that then push to extract uh, contract the diaphragm to push that air out. More importantly, there are spinal accessory nerves that connect to the diaphragm and the muscles of the diaphragm that make that movement possible. So the question is, is that motor neurons are involved with pretty much every muscle of our body and every organ, but some of them are more exertional and those are the ones that tend to be more prone to the effects of motor neuron disease ALS. And that's why we see breathing as something, uh, the spinal accessory nerves are a cranial nerve in the brainstem 
um, that innervate the diaphragm and that's why the diaphragm becomes impacted. So I hope that that helps to clarify for folks. Thank you. What would be a determining factor in delineating between somebody with FTD and Parkinsonism versus somebody with ALS and FTD? So that's a great question and an important one and one that might even delay the accurate diagnosis of an ALS FTD overlap. I think Parkinsonism is defined by postural instability, um, bradyphrenia, bradykinesia, which is slowing of movement, slowing of thinking, and um, gait instability. Although you can see those features in motor neuron disease, uh, the motor changes of motor neuron disease tend to have more to do with muscle and the impact of muscle messages not getting there correctly or loss of support of tone of muscles that need to have tone to be able to do their job. So it's those features that the neurologist and that the providers working with a person with disease would need to be educated on to be able to know what to look for. But um, those of us who see a decent amount of Parkinsonism and see a different decent amount of motor neuron disease can actually recognize why they are distinct. Thanks. There's a couple of questions around diagnosing. Um, so let me just roll these up for you. Could you speak briefly to some of the technology that's used in diagnosing MND? You know, specifically folks are, are familiar with the role of MRI and CAT scan in FTD diagnosis. Um, maybe can you speak of, speak a little bit to the role of imaging in the diagnostic process and then also to the role of um, spinal tap or cerebral spinal fluid tests and what role they play in the diagnostic process here. Okay, so those are all great questions. Um, you know, you're touching on imaging, you're touching on spinal uh, fluid analysis, which uh, can be quite useful for certain proteinopathies like tauopathies, which are seen in PSP and Alzheimer's type dementias. But in ALS, remember you're looking for evidence that lower motor neurons and upper motor neurons are not functioning well or are losing function. So some of that you obtain by clinical history and testing the uh, cranial nerves and uh, muscles during the routine neurology exam. Imaging can show some changes in the cortical spinal tract that descends from the motor cortex to the spinal cord. And there are some hallmark features, but they're not enough to be specific to ALS and not other cortical spinal tract diseases or syndromes or even strokes. So imaging for the diagnosis of ALS isn't really one of the gold standards or one of the things that you look for. It would more be to rule out the possibility that it isn't ALS, that it's PSP, um, that it's another type of dementia where imaging characteristics are more significant, more prominent in the diagnosis. I mentioned CSF, there are some biomarkers, uh, there actually are no known biomarkers right now for ALS motor neuron disease that are reliable and valid for clinical um, diagnosis rendering. So um, in most cases, a lumbar puncture would only be pursued if they were trying to rule out the possibility of other etiologies, again, like a tauopathy um, or an Alzheimer's process. Um, the EMG is considered the gold standard for looking for lower motor neuron disease pro pro problems. And what that is, is it looks at um, individual muscle messages from the spinal cord uh, to muscle. And what they do is they measure the action potentials of those nerve impulses and try to get an understanding of whether or not they're slowing compared to standard or not. Um, so it's those things, the EMG becomes very important in establishing the presence of lower motor neuron disease. Um, although one could EMG the tongue, it's generally the motor speech examination that a speech language pathologist might be able to do that can determine whether the palate is losing tone, whether there's decreased resonance to the speech that would support lower motor neuron innervation problems um, or upper motor neuron speech problems. So it's actually how all these different things, the initial speech language exam, 
um, the uh, EMG, the uh, neurology exam, how they all converge together that leads you to the diagnosis of motor neuron disease. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to coming back after the next section of your presentation. But so let's um, let you move ahead and then we will have time at the end for more questions. Thank you. Great. I mean, these are such thoughtful questions and um, I, I, um, I appreciate um, how confusing all of this could be. Um, I wanted to get to caregiving because that is something that is just very unique um, to FTD, to ALS, um, and particularly ALS FTD. So I have worked with ALS since 2005. I've worked with dementia since probably the late, I would say the late 80s, early 90s. <laughs> so I was very practiced in giving Alzheimer's disease support group or Parkinson's disease support group. It was not until 2005 that I had the opportunity to run my first ALS FTD support group or my first ALS support group. And I have to say, the thing that really just resonated with me was that it was a much more emotionally intense support group than I had ever been a part of. And part of why it was, was because the physical demands of a person with motor neuron disease are quite significant. Caregivers are having to transfer, they're having to feed. Sometimes it could take three hours to groom and dress someone just for the day, and that's exhausting. And there are some significant risks. There's swallowing risks, there's breathing risks, there's eating risks, depending on the way the motor neuron disease presents. I found that in frontal temporal dementia support groups, there was also a lot of emotion because people don't understand the types of problems that individuals with frontal temporal dementia have. You know, the behavioral disinhibition. Well, that's not forgetting. How could they have dementia? Or the language problems. Are they drunk? Why are they talking like that? So the social challenges that come with helping somebody who has a different type of dementia process are quite great. So caregiving in the context of the ALS FTD overlap to me deserves quite a bit of attention because it's a very, very unique experience and it's very demanding. And that's why I dedicate the last part of my presentation to a focus on caregivers. So something, if you've ever heard me talk about caregiving in any capacity before, something I will talk about is the importance of expectations. When our expectations for ourselves or another person are too high, we get frustrated, the other person becomes frustrated, and there's stress. If the expectations are too low, there are opportunities for worry, distress, anger, <laughs> irritation, a lot of different things. So it's ideal for expectations to be just right and reflective of reality. The biggest caregiving challenges emerge when expectations do not reflect reality. And let's pull the elephant out in, from the corner and talk about frontal temporal dementia syndromes. One of the biggest things that you see is anosognosia. The person with disease does not see a problem. They don't see a problem. The problem is real. The neurologist sees the problem. The physical therapist sees the problem. The speech therapist sees the problem. The bank sees the problem. Everyone sees the problem, but the person with disease. And so when they look in the mirror, they don't see the problem, which makes caregiving extremely hard because you're the tough guy. You're the person who has to come down and try to protect their safety. And to some extent, <clears throat> providers like myself don't even understand this. We really don't. And the day-to-day -day struggle of living with somebody who can't see reality for what it is anymore because the brain has lost the ability to do so, that's a challenge. It's a frustrating, scary, anger-filled, um, sad-filled experience. So in order to reduce some of the frustration, it's important to constantly be mindful of expectations. So how? How? You've probably racked your, your brains multiple times late at night or exhausted um, thinking, how do I do this better? How do I do this differently? Well, a key point in 
ALS FTD overlap and in just AFTD alone is to gauge how much awareness the person with disease has. When awareness is present for the person, he or she can be involved with advanced directives and care decisions and making their intentions known and directing the team. But when that awareness is absent, the expectations for the person need to match her, his or her ability. So this will come up in ALS FTD care all the time where let's say um, an individual has a lack of awareness and they need more nutrition because of their swallowing problems. And the team will recommend a peg tube or thickening their food or increasing their caloric intake. And the person without awareness will say, I don't need any of that. It's disgusting. I'm not doing that. Have you ever had thickened food? I'm not eating thickened food. You drink it. Um, or I don't need a tube. And so the frustration ensues because <coughs> the recommendation is beyond what the person needs. But then the caregiver may feel very guilty enforcing a health care um, advocate role. You know, um, going against what the person with disease wants or says he or she wants despite safety and it introduces a lot of stress. Interventions really need to be directed at families and caregiver teams when a person with ALS FTD does not have awareness or has restricted awareness and a lot of frustration comes from it trying to expect the person with disease to do things or follow through on things. Why can't they do this? You know, I turned away for five minutes. Why do they keep getting up from the chair when they know they're unstable? They don't know they're unstable. That's the problem. So how do you help the person with ALS FTD? There can be lack of awareness. Um, they can't anticipate what's going to happen. They may be easily agitated. Um, there may be apathy. There may be indifference, um, withdrawal, frustration. So what tools can be used to help the person with disease? A big problem is communication. And like I mentioned before with frontal tem temporal dementia clinic, depends sometimes on the neurologist you see or the education you have about whether or not a speech language pathology uh, consultation will be ordered. There are an augmentative communication clinic, they call it an alternative augmentative communication clinic, where devices can be used to facilitate expression. And just having a way to communicate might be able to help the person with FTD reduce agitation and frustration. There could be counseling to address anticipatory fear that now their family history is positive for dementia or motor neuron disease. Functional communication boards could be used so that the person could point to what he or she needs. The family around a person can be educated how to simplify communication using two word phrases like a noun and a verb rather than a five word phrase. So instead of saying, what would you like for dinner tonight? Saying fish or chicken. Using routine and schedule places less demand on memory and less demand on executive function. When a person can no longer hold books, audio books can be used. For the person who has difficulty uh, with behavioral interactions, social interactions, or a person with more advanced disease, you want to limit unfamiliar people and unfamiliar settings for that person. When the person with disease has a lot of disinhibition and they say and do things that are inappropriate, physically flanking that person is important. So when you go to a restaurant, rather than letting them sit at the end of the table, have two people sit on either side of them. Providing distractions such as touch or massage when a person's agitating can redirect their sensory experience. Introducing someone the person loves can be important for distraction if he or she becomes agitated. Sometimes a very simple cognitive task like counting to 10 can help to counteract pseudobulbar affect. So pseudobulbar affect is a reflex that goes wrong, so to speak, and makes someone more emotionally reactive. So sometimes when a person starts crying and they can't shut it off, one of the interventions I've used is have them count by twos to 20, and that actually helps to shut down the um, interaction. If they don't have speech, I have them use their hands or write 
the twos to 20 in a series. Um, it's important to recognize that the person with disease does have to accept a change in his or her function, and they may not like being dependent on you or people around them. That's part of the reality. In situations where there's severe agitation that really does risk um, falling or risk safety, or with really severe pseudobulbar affect, medication may be required. And that's where a psychiatry consultation or psychology consultation may be appropriate. And it's important to recognize when a person could use durable medical equipment in their day-to-day -day environment. Maybe they need a shower chair. Maybe they shouldn't be standing in the shower with the wet, slippery surface on the base of the shower floor. Maybe they need um, a bedside commode. There are physical therapy and occupational therapy providers who can come out to your home and help evaluate things to make the day-to-day -day life go more smoothly for the person with disease. But it becomes really important to set realistic expectations for the person with disease. And you'll know that your expectations aren't realistic if you're frustrated, if you're burned out, or if you start to withdraw. So that's helping um, people with disease, but how do we help family members and caregivers for someone with disease? When is help needed? Well, when you find that you're irritated or you're resentful all the time, you're constantly saying, I'm tired, you're anxious, you start developing new physical problems or you start having an old back injury become more and more of an intrusion to your daily activities, or when you're overcome with grief, it is very common, it is very healthy to feel anger and anxiety in the context of caring for someone with FTD, with ALS, and definitely in the situation of dealing with someone with ALS FTD overlap. Anger and anxiety are emotions that evolved. They're emotions that we have when there's a response to real threat. And the reality is, is that if you have ALS FTD, life is threatening. And more importantly, if you're caring for somebody, if your spouse has ALS FTD, if your child has ALS FTD, your life is threatened. This isn't what you wanted of retirement. This isn't how you wanted to end work. This isn't what you thought the next two years would be like. You're exhausted. It's threatening. So what are some things that can help family members? Um, first of all, getting some neuropsychological assessment or cognitive screening of the person and knowing where to place expectations can be really helpful. Getting durable medical equipment uh, placed in your home becomes really helpful, like I mentioned, for helping the person with disease. And getting communication devices, if the person has a decent amount of cognitive function left, that they can benefit. Learn how to do some behavioral management, learn how to avoid triggers, choose your arguments, choose your battles, participate in ALS clinic or FTD clinics where people have a familiar experience with disease, get more education about ALS FTD overlap and the different stages of disease, get more help in home, get a housekeeper, get a home health aide, start to ask for help. Get involved with grief counseling because grief is real and I'm gonna come back to that in a minute. Get counseling to address your fear of the familial role of ALS FTD overlap. Make sure you get respite time away from the person with disease and learn how to give up perfectionism. You know, it doesn't have to be you that, that runs things and does things and you don't have to feel guilt if a a respite caregiver comes in and something doesn't go exactly right. You have a life too and you have to replenish your resources so there's more of you to give to the person with disease later. Work with other family members. Do not wait for a crisis. Ad address advanced directives and legal issues as soon as possible. Educate providers who work with your person who has ALS FTD about what he or she may not know. Self-care becomes very, very important and set realistic expectations for yourself. So what does self-care look like for caregivers? We're running out of time, so I'm gonna try to make it quick. 
regularly schedule time for yourself. Be very specific with what you need. Schedule and attend your appointments, particularly if they're for monitoring your health. Do not aggravate old physical injuries and certainly do not aggravate old emotional injuries. You have feelings and be honest about those. Use your faith if faith provides you with support. When you feel anger and frustration starting to crescendo, it's a sign that you need to provide yourself with more care. When you feel avoidant or despondent, it's a sign that you need care. You cannot provide care to others when you have nothing left to give. So common questions from family that I get are, I have anxiety over making decisions for the person with disease. What if he or she would have wanted something differently? Or what if he or she isn't cognitively impaired enough or unaware enough? And it, it, how do I know when it's time for me to take over with decision making? How do I know that he or she isn't having just a psychological uh, intervention, you know, adjustment reaction. How much should I let him do for himself versus how much to assist? When do I invoke advanced directives? What has to happen for that to happen? So the mantra I want you to think about for yourself is that caregiving challenges offer you the opportunity to modify your expectations, to center your expectations and to recalibrate. I know that caregiving is challenging. I know that you're also grieving at the same time. And the importance is, is that you take good care of yourself and that you align your expectations for yourself with realistic goals of what a human can accomplish and that you get resources to support what you can't reliably sustain. I do wanna say one last bit on, cause my time is running out on grief. Grief is inherent, it's implicit to the ALS FTD experience. The goal is to honor the person with disease and his or her values, the family values, make sure that a family has support. Advocacy organizations like AFTD provide tremendous education and resources. There are support groups. There's no right or wrong, and that's really important for you to know. I will say this, sometimes support groups aren't for everyone. Sometimes you don't wanna know what's coming down the pike in terms of the issues you may have to deal with. Sometimes you don't want to hear what other people's problems are because it overwhelms you. Sometimes support groups were helpful, but they don't become helpful and that's okay. You do what's right for you and you calibrate it with what you need in the right moment. So to summarize today, I hope that I expanded your knowledge of ALS FTD overlap. I hoped I outline to you why I think the clinical experience for the person with ALS FTD overlap has to change and reflect the last 10 years of scientific and clinical discovery. We have tremendous opportunities. ALS or dementia by themselves are hard enough as illnesses, but even harder when they manifest together. And importantly, support does exist, but we need to be more explicit in defining what it looks like and informing support by advances uh, in scientific and clinical discovery that have been made. The more we can focus on ALS FTD in our community, then we enhance our ability to make further scientific and clinical discoveries. So with that, I end my presentation portion and hope to take some questions. Thank you for your patience um, and I hope that this was helpful. It's wonderful. Thank you very much again, Dr. Raj. And we do have time for some questions. So for folks who have been um, sending the questions in, I invite you to continue to do that. Um, we'll get to as many as we can. And, um, excuse me, and then we'll wrap up um, the presentation. So I do want to bring you back to a point that you've said, and you've really described some of the dilemma around the epidemiology or being able to kind of count and see what do we know with certainty. But there is some interest in having you speak a little bit more about how much do we know about the number of people who are diagnosed with the overlap of FTD and ALS each year. And you know, it's sort of the opposed to how many people are diagnosed with either one of those disorders on their own. And then also if you could speak a little bit more to the role of the C9 ORF72 mutation and the amount of the overlap that it's responsible for. Sure, I'll do my best. Um, although I work with genetic researchers, it's not my area of special specialty. So if I overspeak, underspeak, I'm the first to say what I don't know. 
<laughs> okay. I, I think it. I think the epidemiology of this phenomenon is truly challenged. We really don't know how much overlap is out there per year. And that's where conversations like the one we're having today become so very important. There's so much we could be doing to improve our capture of epidemiology. It's expensive though. And part of it is, is it's expensive in resources and time to collect all the data points that I asked for in my dream world. <laughs> um, about cognition and muscular mass and tone. And we really don't have, I don't know of anyone who has good numbers on the epidemiology, the incidence and prevalence of how many people in the world, in our US, currently exist with overlap. And anyone who says that they do have those numbers, I, I would say it's, it's potentially riddled with bias. I, I, in a perfect world, we'd, Every neuromuscular neurologist would be asking about the changes in thinking, language, and behavior. They're not. Not because they don't want to, but maybe they don't know. They haven't received the training. They don't know the expansion of the ideas and the concepts. And further, in FTD clinic, I know many very gifted behavioral neurologists who don't examine the patient fully and don't see the physical signs. And until some of this is more systemically um, in place, um, for all institutions that see patients with primary neurodegenerative disease, I don't see getting a true capture on the epidemiology. I mean, that's one of the final points I made is our understanding of this is greatly evolving, but it still has a long way to go. And by pushing the envelope a little further, <laughs> I'm trying to get us to the point where we'll have good data. Well, and folks in the FTD world can appreciate just the challenges of even being able to estimate with any kind of accuracy the number of people affected by FTD. You know, so the, the lack of biomarkers for motor neuron disease and the lack of biomarkers for FTD, I think, are um, contributing to this. And hopefully, as we move that science forward, it will be easier to know with certainty for those folks who are getting into the evaluation setting, um, which of these neurodegenerative diseases or something else is affecting, you know, and, and uh, underlying cause for the symptom. Um, right. In terms of the, the C9, can I just follow up with you quickly there? Um, is this the only one gene responsible for the FTD ALS overlap? And then also, if you have the C9 mutation, um, if you have FTD and ALS, does that mean that you have the C9 mutation? Okay, so first of all, it's the most common genetic, it's the most common known genetic factor that can account for ALS FTD overlap. It is possible that there are additional genes that might be involved, and that's under active study and investigation. It is the most common. Um, it's the most common source of familial. Um, or hereditary ALS FTD overlap um, for both ALS and FTD, and it accounts for a decent proportion of sporadic cases in ALS as well. There are many people, not I shouldn't say many, that's a definite overstatement. There are some people who will develop ALS FTD overlap that do not have C9 or F72 repeat expansion. And so it is possible to have ALS FTD and not have C9. It's possible to have C9 or F72 repeat expansion, but not be symptomatic. Those are some of the things that larger program projects through NIH are studying right now, is what does the genotype predict about <clears throat> the phenotype or clinical presentation and what it doesn't. It is all a very complex world, you know, and I know that here increasingly we're encouraging people who see the potential for family patterns of inheritance as they look at their family history to be curious and to look into what would it mean to um, learn more about the value of understanding their family history in terms of the potential for a mutation to be influencing that and then to contact us or to contact their physician to find out more information about really what would that mean if they wanted to have the diagnosed person, the affected person, um, to pursue that question of is there an identifiable mutation there that might begin to, 
to answer some of these questions, which doesn't really speak to the variability in folks with, with a known C9 mutation. So um, we do always encourage people to be curious about the research that's going on and to find avenues that you can trust to follow up with that. Because as Dr. Rush has said, a lot of this is changing very rapidly as the, as the field progresses, um, as all the fields progress. Okay, I wanted to take you in a little bit of a different direction and ask, um, there's a, one of our listeners is interested in any measures that you um, re feel differentiate reliably between speech changes that are associated with PPA or a proxy of, of speech. Um, and so again, I think trying to differentiate between that PPA presentation and what might be more um, associated with the ALS types of symptoms. Um, so let me clarify the question. Um, agrammatic progressive aphasia can occur in motor neuron disease and apraxia of speech can occur in motor neuron disease. So tell me more about the question. Well, um, so both, both conditions can occur with comorbid motor neuron disease. So I think the question is around, if I understand it correctly, it's are there measures or tools that can help to differentiate or tease them apart? Yeah, I from mean- From a clinical a, standpoint. So the, you would wanna see a speech language pathologist who has good experience in motor speech evaluation. And motor speech evaluation helps to kind of distinguish which, um, which components of, um, of motor function contribute to um, speech agrammatism, which is the primary progressive aphasia, uh, agrammatic speech uh, um, uh, variant versus true dyspraxis of speech, um, being able to produce speech sounds on command, uh, uh, dissociation of knowledge of speech sounds from the function of speech sounds. So um, it would be seeing a speech language pathologist who is, capable of doing motor speech evaluation. And so why would I say it like that? Well, there are a lot of really great speech language pathologists out there who are focused on diagnosis or dysarthria or swallowing, but they don't do motor speech evaluation. So it's important to find someone, if you were really interested in disentangling those two conditions, you would want to make sure you had a very reliable motor speech evaluation by a provider who knew how to do it. Thank you. Um, question about sort of the experience of people who are undergoing a lot of tests um, and what are the direct treatment implications of some of those testing. So if somebody already has FTD and motor involvement, does the etiology matter that much for treatment? Um, I would argue, so if someone already has FTD and motor involvement or already has FTD with motor neuron disease involvement. So uh, you could have FTD with motor involvement, uh, Parkinsonism, bulbar dysfunction, and it wouldn't necessarily lead to the safety concerns or the quick progression that would occur with the clinical presentation of comorbid ALS motor neuron disease. So the problem with ALS motor neuron disease is, is it more quickly moving progression. It's a very fast moving um, disease. Um, whereas Parkinsonism and other motor manifestations of primary neurodegenerative disease tend to be slower moving. So there are different level of safety concerns and issues and symptoms that need to be monitored if motor neuron disease symptoms are present relative to non-motor neuron disease symptoms like um, Parkinsonism. I hope I'm making sense. Well, you're fielding a lot of really hard questions very well, and we're very appreciative. But I do have to tell folks that we're out of time, and so I want to take this <laughs> time to wrap up. Um, so um, thank you, Dr. Beth Rush from Mayo Clinic in Florida for this wonderful presentation. Um, as you can tell, it stimulated a lot of thought and a lot of questions. We have um, the opportunity for our staff to kind of um, vet some of the questions and to the extent that we can reach out to you with some key ones to supplement what we have. We will try to get back to people within the extent of what we can do. Um, but uh, my team here would caution me not to overpromise. And I would encourage folks a couple things. 
um, please keep us in mind for any ways that we can help to support you. We do have a phone support group that is for caregivers of people with ALS and FTD or this overlap disorder that we are speaking about right now. And as Dr. Rush mentioned, the specific and targeted supports for this you know, this group of folks who are really challenged in so many ways are limited. And so if that's something that might be of interest to you, I do encourage you to reach out to us here um, at the office and we'll see if we can get you some more information. Um, and so again, with that, uh, really thank you very much. I guess the other commercial I should say is that Dr. Beth Rush has also agreed to be one of the presenters at our upcoming conference in Baltimore. So if this has been a stimulating presentation for you and you would like to follow up, please look into joining us on April 17th in Baltimore. And with that, I will thank you all very much for joining us. Wish you a happy holiday season. And again, Dr. Rush, thank you so much. Thanks for having me.